It used to be I could leave my front door, walk four or five miles south. There was nothing between my front door and the Missouri River. And now there's roads and paths and pickups and people and, you know, just oil field. I got to sit there and watch my cattle ranch turn into an oil field over the period of four years. Having massive oil development in this area is pretty scary for our community and our agriculture and tourist industry. I grew up in an area that had some oil development. Uh, in Colorado, it's called the Wattenberg Field. And that was not, that was back when they were doing just a well, not that deep, not that big a deal. But now that they have come up with the hydraulic fracturing and all that, it's a much different type of drilling and a much different type of production. The hydraulic fracturing uses a tremendous amount of water. And after it's been used, it's no longer part of our system. It usually goes into deep injection wells. Therefore, the water is gone forever. And what does that mean to those of us who are downstream? Those of us who need the water for agriculture, for our hay, for our livestock, for our wells. What does it mean for the future when we we're in drought? You can't assume that we're going to turn on the faucet and there's going to be water running out. can't remember the year, but it must have been about 1997 or 98 when the coal bed methane wells first came into our area of the state. And the industry came to the DNRC to set up a uh, controlled groundwater area. Basically, it gave industry a right to extract water from the coal bed methane wells as long as they agreed to provide water to people that were affected within a certain radius of the wells. Part of the problem with that was it was also the people's aquifers that they rely on for drinking and stock water. And in the country we live in, we don't have a lot of surface water. And the springs and some of the surface water we do have is connected to these underground aquifers, according to the monitoring that our controlled groundwater area technical advisory committee has done they found that there's no new water coming in from rain or flood events. These aquifers have only recovered to 70 or 80 percent of their original water levels and so according to our predictions they may not ever get back to where they were. These people have lost 25 percent of their available water in a 10-year oil and gas development period that will probably never recover the effects are real to those people and they were promised water, replacement water, but the companies now are gone and the water is not there. There's been a lot of places, uh, particularly in Colorado, where they've taken a lot of water out of some of the aquifers and it has dropped the level of the aquifers to the point that they are no longer allowing irrigation and that sort of thing in the eastern parts of Colorado. Most of the cattle ranch was watered by shallow wells. Uh, between 40 feet and 120 feet is where we get our water. I've done a lot of the math. They use, let's say, 3 million gallons of water on a frack. I think that's between 2 and 3 million gallons of water. I go fire up my irrigation pump. It runs for three days, two days. That's how much water they use in a frack. The difference between my irrigation water and the frack water is when I'm done using my irrigation water, it's still part of the freshwater cycle. It's either going to evaporate or it's going to go back into the groundwater. I can pump it. Somebody else somebody else can drink the water when I'm done using it. When they're done using frack water, it gets pumped 10,000 feet down into disposal. Sooner or later, I mean, there's just not going to be much fresh water left. That's just the way it is.
Well, I think there's a lot of non, you know, non-point source pollution. It's the guy that's driving the saltwater truck that left his valve open and it spilled all the way down the highway. This little saltwater spill, that little saltwater spill, it just all adds up. That's I'm actually more freaked out about salt water than oil spills, to be honest with you. The salt is more harmful to the soil than oil is. The salt kills ground. You're using a lot of chemicals, none of which are particularly good for people. And um, apparently there's no way to clean this water. So it's hauled away and injected far into the earth into supposedly inaccessible aquifers. But the earth is an ever-changing thing. It does not stay static. So I don't see how they can guarantee that these aquifers will never break apart or leak into other aquifers that we do need for potable water, for agriculture, and just for our everyday living. The water that's used at the head of the stream flows downstream, and we're seeing issues with radioactivity, we're seeing issues with sludge, different chemicals, oil spills in our water. There's horror stories about the frack went bad, they had a blowout in the casing at 200 feet, which people screw stuff up. I mean, mock and fail of the day on Facebook, just look at it. And we've seen what's happening in Clark, Wyoming, just over the border. Their wells have been breached by the um, oil companies. Their property values are gone. If they wanted to move, they couldn't move. Who's going to want to buy their property after they find out that their water is bad? I feel like surface disturbances and things like that over time will heal, but never when water's ruined. Like if this water never comes back, or if it's too polluted to ever use again, or if you put it on your soil to irrigate and it's tainted your soil, it's, it's a serious consequence. I guess fracking could become a statewide issue as we see these areas that we never expected to be drilled or have marketable resources may become marketable with this technology. It can happen anywhere that there's oil and gas deposits. They're pretty well scattered throughout the state of Montana. I don't know that we will ever be able to completely eliminate development. But what we do need to do is make sure that the development is done in a, as economical and as environmentally friendly a way as possible. I guess I'd like to see the state be more, or at least have some language in some statute someplace that they're more, that, that, the, pipe, that the companies have to do a, a better job of installing some sort of leak prevention on pipeline stuff. It seems like there's way too many pipeline leak, rupture, spills, because it doesn't seem like they do that good of a job. We can have an amicable situation if um, they're held accountable and they know that they will be held accountable. One of the things is to make sure that we have laws in place that protect the people who already live here and that those laws are abided by. And that may take uh, a citizenry who will go out and help our government in the state to make sure that these things are taken care of. I think grassroots organizations are sometimes the only way that things like this are controlled. Our state agencies don't have the manpower to do these things. It depends on us to take some of that responsibility and move forward and help the state to make sure that all the rules are followed. Well, we have a tradition of grassroots being the one thing that does make a difference. And when you get together with your neighbors and you have a common goal to protect your properties and your way of life, it makes a difference. Having a whole a lot of people uh, with the same vision is the only way that we're going to get things done. The more people we can get on board, that's where we have our power, and so without groups like Northern Plains, it'd be really impossible. But it makes you feel good. It makes you feel like you're not just standing up alone, because if you do, it feels kind of hopeless. <laughs>